Dimmer. A dimmer oh, when we use in the, the background. Are we ready to go, sister? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. good morning. And in case you just tuned in, my name is Pat Reedy, and I'm a member of the Tabor Life Institute. And I also teach at a local boys' college prep school where I teach theology in Spanish. And for about the last five years, I've been teaching theology of the body in our moral theology class and in a couple other classes. And this year we have a, an elective called John Paul II, for seniors. And Father Tom Loya is not with us today because he and the rest of the Tabor Life team are out in Michigan on a married couple's retreat in a very nice place in Michigan. So they got out of rainy Chicago on a beautiful what has become to be the celebration of St. Patrick's Day in Chicago, the Saturday before St. Patrick's Day. The river doesn't have to be dyed green anymore because it's already green. <laughs> but they do it anyway and the people, the people are downtown and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful day. So in that spirit, why don't we start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, and we glorify you for having sent your Son, Jesus Christ, into our lives. And we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to us, that we may embrace this incredible teaching, this heritage, given to us by the church, through the late, great John Paul II. Lord, help us to understand the meaning of our own masculinity and femininity. Help us to understand the spiritual and the spousal meanings of our bodies so that we can live a true communion of persons and participate in your Trinitarian love. And most of all, today as we come before you, Father, we ask you for the grace to understand how to bring this revolutionary teaching to the next generation so that they can pass it on so that the whole world can be transformed to live the gospel in the image of Jesus Christ and we ask our Blessed Mother to pray for us today Hail Mary full of grace the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb Jesus Holy Mary Mother of God pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death Amen our Lady, Mother of fairest love, pray for us. John Paul the Great, pray for us. St. Patrick, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a, it's a good day. For many reasons. Thank you for being here today. I'm not sure how many people were able to watch a, the presentation two months ago. That was part one. We didn't know it then but we know it now, it was part one of what is at least a two-part series on how to bring Theology of the Body to teens. What I'd like to call this little presentation, this, this conversation that we're about to have, is Teens and Theology of the Body Before and After. And I think you're going to be amazed with some of the evidence I have of what our teens are t capable of when they, when they have a chance to learn this message. When I treat this in a class. And I know some of you are parents and you're not teachers. Most of you are probably not teachers. But I think we're going to draw on a lot of principles today that, that can work for parents as well as educators. But when I pre present this in class, and I know I'm going to have a period of time with students, I often start with this challenge and this image. I say, picture yourself a couple years from now. You're in college. You're at a party. You look over and you see your roommate having a conversation with one of his friends. And you hear the friends say, well, that's just stupid. I love my girlfriend, and I don't think there's anything wrong with sleeping with her. That's how I show her my love. The Catholic Church is just crazy. And your roommate turns to you with a blank stare on his face and shrugs his shoulders, kind of like, help! <laughs> what, what do I do? All right, step in and tell me what you do. Take over. What do you say? Now, that's how I usually begin the presentation. What do you say? What do you think most... Now, these are kids in Catholic schools, and I happen to think that we're in one of the finest Catholic schools around. We have some of the, the greatest young men there are in the country. What do you think a 15, 16, 17-year-old boy who's been formed well says in, in defense of our, the moral teaching of the church around sexuality? 
G give me some answers. What do you think are some of the most popular answers? It's a sin. It's a, it's a sin. Good. Can't do that. It's a sin. Okay. It's wrong. You have to wait till marriage. You have to wait till marriage. Good. Anything else? That's not the right way to go. It's not the right way to go. You're harming both of you. Yes? Um, I don't have children, but I have a lot of friends and teenagers. And my mom told us you can't be a second to raise your parents. You can't be a parent to raise your parents. And that was something that, that was the only thing she gave me. Um, and that's why I told my parents to take kids. Because when you say it's a standard, don't do it. I just think it's irrelevant. So the comment is that, that some mothers have told their children that you, you shouldn't have sex until you're ready to be married. You shouldn't be married until you're ready to have children because saying it's a sin or it's wrong just, just doesn't, doesn't work. Well, this, this is teens before This is theology. teens before theology of the body. Now, this, this is a, a very good sample of what happens in a class, typically. Most people are silent. A few kids have the courage to raise their hand. And here are a couple of the answers I get. I, I usually get, it's wrong. It's a mortal sin. We go up a little bit. Mortal sin is good Catholic school. It's intrinsically evil. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> Isn't it great that there are 16-year-old boys that know something's intrinsically evil? It's phenomenal. So we want to affirm that. But then I'll say, okay, now do you really think that's going to stop this guy at the party from moving into the next room or whatever he's going to do? And they laugh. Oh, no, 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 no. All right. So what can we tell teens that's going to allow them, first of all, to feel the confidence in the lifestyle that they're living, that they want to live, to be able to not to have to lie about it, and secondly, to really engage someone, a peer, in a conversation where, where they feel capable of giving him some language that may even be persuasive, or at least stop to make the person think. That was the before. I want to read two essays. These are, these are verifiable essays <laughs> that, w that I gave on a test about three weeks after this question. We, do, we, we covered this for about three weeks, and then I had him write an essay. We called the roommate Catholic Cal, and we called the friend Foolish Freddy. And the essay says, after you hear this conversation, what are you going to say? Step in, step aside, Cal, and what are you going to say to Foolish Freddy? And I just want to read a couple of them. Here you go. Listen, Freddie, there are five reasons, main reasons, why premarital sex is wrong. They are, one, that you're lying with the language of your body. <laughs> Love has three words, you, only, and forever. Second, premarital relations are always an instance of using each other. Third, one flesh union is wedding flesh is wedding vows in the flesh. It points to the communion of persons in the Trinity, the love of Christ, the groom for his bride, the church, and the life and love we will receive in heaven when we are married to God. Fourth, it's adultery in advance. Fifth, it's re-gifting yourself. This is because when you use one flesh union, you are giving the gift of yourself. A gift is a sacrifice. It's a part of yourself, and it's given freely with no expectations of return. So the gift in yourself, in your case, loses its value. Also, you are treating women the wrong way, with an explana explanation point. Uh, you need to see them as sister bride. This means that first you see women as a person, then you see her as a daughter of God, a tabernacle, an end in herself. Also, to be happy, we must treat ourselves and others according to our nature. John Paul II says that people are never to be used, never to be used, they are an end in themselves. He also said that the only way to discover yourself is in a sincere gift of yourself. Finally, he said that Christ fully reveals man to himself. So, Freddie, that is what the Catholic Church says about human sexuality. Live it and love it, and you will be very, very happy. <laughs> that was person number one. All right, now I want to give you another sampling here. Listen, Freddie. <clears throat> By the way, teens love this kind of stuff. It sounds so good that they love it. They eat it up. Listen, Freddie. <laughs> I'll give you five good reasons why, pre why premarital sex is not a good idea. First of all, sex speaks a language of the body which says you and only you forever. If you have sex before the sacrament in which you are bonded to the other person, then it is lying with your body. You aren't really meaning the language of the body, the gift of yourself, if you aren't willing also to commit with words in the sacrament of marriage. Get it? 
Okay, I'll bring up another point. Sex outside of marriage is using the other person. You are using that other person, which is intrinsically evil. He, he worked it in. <laughs> for your own selfish pleasure. If you really loved her, Freddie, you would wait until marriage and then, quote, show her your love. Right now, you're just using her, and women should never be used because they are God's gift to man. If you were given a gift, would you use it and throw it away when you're done or cherish it and respect it? All right, thirdly, did you know that sex, or let's call it by its proper name, one flesh union, <laughs> gotta love that, <laughs> actually mirrors the Holy Trinity? It is a communion of persons that show their total love for each other. So, now, these are teens, though. So when you do one flesh union outside of marriage, <laughs> you, you are sending a message of defiance to God. How does that feel? Another point I'd like to illustrate for you, Freddie, is that premarital one flesh union is adultery in advance. That's Mary Beth Bonacci, by the way. She came up with that. If you don't marry this girl, how is your future wife going to feel knowing that it isn't, quote, her and only her forever? How much does your yes on the altar mean if you have never said no to someone? Lastly, Freddie, don't you think that when you get married, you, you want someone pure? Well, premarital one flesh union is giving the gift of self. So when you get married, you are really re-gifting yourself. Don't you think your future wife deserves more? And then he has Freddie responding, Oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Wow, I am so foolish. <laughs> so as you can see, <laughs> this, uh, teens are capable of so much more. It's great that they know the doctrine, but they're capable of more. And it, and it actually it starts to become a lot of fun if you loosen up with it a little bit. So I talk a little bit today about this before and after. Um, I would say there are two things we want to keep in mind when we're talking to youth about theology of the body. And I'm not claiming to be an expert. I'm just claiming to be someone who's been trying to do this, stumble through it myself for the last five years. And here are the, some, of the, some of the things I've discovered, and we can have a little bit of discussion. I'm sure there are some people in cyberspace who have found some techniques that work well too. But I'll, I'll talk from my own experience and from the Tabor Life perspective. The Tabor Life perspective is we want to do two things with youth. First of all, youth need structure. They need structure. John Paul II's teaching is extremely dense. You have a PhD in theology and philosophy, you're still going to struggle through John Paul II's theology of the body to some degree. It's very dense. So we need to really notch it down. It, it, so it's helpful if you can find ways to talk to teens that are structured. So as you could tell from that essay, one of the things I've been doing in class is I've been saying, all right, guys, why, can't, why is premarital sex wrong? Here are five reasons. And I write them out on the board. And it gives them something they can sink their teeth into. Okay, I can memorize five reasons. Okay, so that's the first thing. They need some structure. The second thing, however, I think is that I really believe oftentimes with youth, and we see this in the secular context all the time, <clears throat> We really aim way too low. You got to aim high. Give them the ethos. You can give them a structure, so especially the kids that maybe aren't, their brains aren't as developed yet, they have something they can remember. Okay, I got five reasons, not just one, and it's not just intrinsically evil, it's a sin, don't do it. It, it actually has some language that is intriguing, it makes sense. But then you want to infuse that structure with, with an ethos. And if you've been taking class with Father Tom, you understand ethos is your, the approach to life. It's the way we see. And, At the Tabor Life Institute, we talk very often about developing the theology of the body or the sacramental ethos. Ethos means our attitude about all of life. How do we see all of life? And you've probably seen Father Tom do this. And in the high school level, we've added a little something to this. Okay. John Paul II, when it comes to sexuality, I tell the teens, he's going to take you to school. He's going to school you on sexuality. We ha I think we have to convince teens that we've got something that they don't have that they need. Okay, so. The ethos is S-C-H-L. Does anybody remember what that means? This is, now, this is a quiz for you people who have been here before. S, S is, good, sacramental. K 
Catholic. H is human. And L is liturgical. In other words, the, the way the church sees all of reality is sacramental, the invisible being revealed in the visible through the physical. That's a, sa- that's a Catholic way to see all of reality. Catholic. That's what's most human. Seeing life sacramentally is what's most human. And it's also liturgical, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we want, we, want to, we want to form young people in an ethos. And what I like to do now with the teens is say, These are, this is your theology of the body glasses. Okay? Seeing all of life through the theology of the body. Or in other words, it's our worldview. give the teen structure, but we want to infuse it wherever we can with this world view. These kids today, our children and our relatives, who are looking to us to guide them, even the most homeschool kid, I'm going to dare say this, even the most homeschool kid, unless he's never been in a shopping market, he's never seen anything on TV, and he's never driven down an expressway with a billboard unless we've kept that kid from all of those things. Whether he wants to or not, he's breathing in a secular ethos. You you can't help it. It's the water in which we swim in this country. And the messages that are coming through about sexuality and the body and masculinity and femininity are are not the messages that John Paul II and the church are trying to teach but they're getting that message. And so what we want to do with teens is while we make it accessible and fun and give them, give, break it down, we also, we're, the business that we're about is reshaping their ethos, helping them see all of life, and especially male-female, through the Catholic lens, through the theology of the body. And this is the best way to do it. Okay, now, Sometimes, believe it or not, I have a problem making that point. So I want to show a movie clip that I think will drive this home to a degree. And let me set up the the film real quick. It's from Mel Gibson's The Patriot. Has anybody seen that? Okay. It's a good film. It's rated R. It's rated R for violence. And this scene has a little bit of violence, but it's pretty much Hollywood-style violence. And real quickly, Mel Gibson... This is the, the, uh, the, the movie takes place back in the time of the Revolutionary War, and Mel Gibson has been fighting on the side of the, the Continentals in other wars, Bunker Hill, French, uh, French Indian War, and he's, been, he's a war hero, but he's quit, and he never talks about it. And now his oldest son is 18 and wants to go enter the Revolutionary War, which is just starting to break out. And we're going to see a brief scene for about a minute where Mel Gibson exp- expresses why he doesn't want to go to war, And then we're going to fast forward to a scene in which the British come to his house, they burn it down, they shoot one of his seven children, a boy, and then they take off his oldest son for treason, the 18-year-old, and they take him him away to hang him. And we're (coughs) we're going to see what Mel does. This first little clip is just short. Okay, sister, I think that's good. Okay. I think you get the picture. <clears throat> and I think you realize he's going to save the, save the day. <clears throat> okay. Now, why do I play that movie? <clears throat> that, that movie always sticks in my mind, that scene. And, and I, know, I know analogies always fall short. But I, but I think the movie's a, it's a good analogy. Because I can't imagine how any father would have to go through something like that. 
And maybe some father back in the revolutionary days had to do something like that. I don't know. You would hope that would never have to happen. But a circumstance arose where those kids had, had to defend themselves. And could you see, it was a very good scene, wasn't it? Could you see the fright in the kids' eyes? What, what, what was it that enabled those kids to do that? Good. Their father's confidence and his instruction. Their love, for their, their, their love for their brother. And there's one other thing. Remember what I remember what I told you boys about shooting? What would they say? Aim small, miss small. Aim small, miss small. And did you see the kid every time? Aim small, miss small. Aim small, miss small. The kid was terrified. Can't believe he's he's probably shooting cans or squirrels or something. His his for for years. Now he's now there are human beings with guns. He's terrified. Steady, steady, okay? But he had the training. He, he was trained for the situation. Now, Mel Gibson didn't want his sons to go to war. Matter of fact, his, his oldest son went uh, enlisted against his dad's permission. That was part of the drama. But he had no choice. So how does this apply to us? We are, we are at a war. We're at a cultural war. Our kids are not... Our kids are not don't have the innocence we would like them to have. They have been exposed to things that I still wish I'd never been exposed to. <laughs> oh my God, what kind of, what did you just ask me? Oh my gosh. Okay. But I think as adults, we need to engage our kids in, this, in the area of human sexuality in a way that doesn't expose them to anything they shouldn't be exposed to. We don't show them pornography and say, all right, this is what you do when you see pornography. No, we say you never, ever look at pornography, for example. But this is what the human body really is. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the real issues. So that when a girl gets a boyfriend and her, a teenage girl, she gets a boyfriend. And, and you know what happens today? What happens if you guys, you guys have teenage girls? They, she gets excited. And what's the first thing she wants to do these days? Run to Facebook and put, in a relationship. I'm in a relationship. Okay. Oh my gosh, all my girlfriends, I've been waiting for this for so long. They went on one date. She changes her Facebook status, right? <laughs> okay. So when, the, when that comes up, when the, with that ethos, which is already in her, comes up, we can say, steady, steady. Okay. We have another ethos at war with what she's already breathing every day. The teenage boy, he's walking down the jewel checkout aisle. Jewel, for those of you who aren't from Chicago, is the, the local, one of the big local uh, grocery stores. And he's getting bombarded with messages from the cultural ethos about sex in the body. And every th all his horror, and he's, oh, what, what do I do? Steady, steady, you can do this, steady. That's a training in emotional strength and interior strength, but it's because he's got, he, we've given him the tools. He's got an arsenal, she's got an arsenal so that it's not just the cultural ethos. I want to read you a few statistics. And you're probably familiar with a lot of these already, but it's, it's good to hear this. One, this is from 2009. One third of girls get pregnant before the age of 20 in the United States of America. 81% of, of teenage pregnancies are to unmarried teens. Who's having abortions? What age? 52% of women attaining, obtaining abortions in the US are younger than 25. Teenagers obtain 20% of abortions, and girls under 15 account for 1.2% of abortions. Who's having abortions? Religion. Women who identify themselves as Protestants obtain 37.4% of abortions. Catholic women account for 31% of all abortions. Those are our kids in Catholic schools. Teens and STIs. T STIs are sexually transmitted infections. Last year, more than three times the number of STIs to teenagers than in 2002. That was, I think this was a couple years ago. The average ages for sexual intercourse. In 2003, 62% of 12th graders had had sexual intercourse compared with 33% of 9th graders. One in three 9th graders in our country are having sex for the first time. The median age at first inter of first intercourse is 16 for, for, girl, for boys and 17 for girls. And the average age of exposure to pornography or to pornographic content in 2007, and I don't believe it's gone down much if it has, is 11 years old. 
Approximately 90% of children between the ages of 8 and 16 have seen pornography on the internet. So we're living in a different world, and we need, we need to use means. All right, so what do we do about this? I'm going to give you five principles, five principles that I think can help us to infuse a new ethos in our kids via John Paul II. And don't be afraid because we have Super Pope. Yes, he's here. Super Pope. We got him. All right, and that's the first one. A new ethos. Right, and pardon me, I tried to come up with something you could remember, just like we do for teens. And <laughs> some of this is a little bit of a stretch, but work with me, okay? <clears throat> All right. The first attitude or principle we need to have working with teens is that we really need to consider ourselves the experts. About four years ago, I was giving a talk with another couple. We're doing Spanish speaking ministry, and it was a Hispanic couple. And this woman came up and gave her testimony about how she raised her kids. She said, I never learned this, but I knew it in my heart. I always knew this. I read the poem. I always knew this. This is how I raised my kids. <coughs> and someone raised her hand and said, well, how, how did you do it? How did you do it with your kids? She said, my first attitude was, I know more about this than you do. We all know more about this than teens do. Teens think they know a lot about it because they're texting and they're on Facebook and they're talking about it. Teens always think they knew more, more than adults <laughs> do. And then... Ten years later, they, don't, they can't realize how they forgot so much. <laughs> so we have to realize we're the experts. And we have to make ourself, ourselves experts in this area. W Christopher West is, is an expert in this. And he's made this very accessible for adults. And one of the things he recognizes is that when adults start to get into this stuff, it brings up things for us. We realize, geez, I may not be living this to the extent that I should be. Or there are wounds in me that I didn't recognize before. That, that's okay. This is all part of God's plan so that as we get healed and learn more about our own sexuality, even if we're 40, 50, 60 years old, we can pass it on. It's not too late. We're the teachers and the world is the classroom. We're, we're taking them with John Paul to, to school. S-C-H-L, school. And we have to have that attitude. And if you're not brushed up enough, well, that's, that's why we're doing these things. Okay. John Paul II is like our coach. Chicagoans, everybody knows who Mike Ditka is, right? <laughs> right. Chicagoans all know Mike Ditka, coach of the Bears, Chicago Bears football team in the 1980s. They won a, a, a national championship with him. And Ditka's uh, bigger than life around here, isn't he? He's still bigger than life. I don't even think he even does anything anymore, but he's bigger than life. <laughs> And there, remember the old joke about the Bears, you know, if the Bears played every other team in the NFL, who would win? And you'd, you'd, the Bears, the right? Bears. The Bears with the Chicago accent. And then they'd say, well, what if it was just Ditka against every other team in the NFL? Ditka, Ditka, Ditka would win, right? Okay. Why? Because he's the coach. Ditka's the coach. Hey, we've got the coach. We've got the T.O.B. coach. Okay. John Paul II. Do not be afraid. We have the coach. So we go to him, learn, and bring it to the young people. Okay, number two. <clears throat> what was number two? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is where I'm pushing it a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> Treat them as leaders. Every time one of us in Tabor Life talks to teens, we make sure at the beginning, and this, and this is sincere, it's not just a ploy, it's very important when you're working with young people, to, to let teens know we believe in them and we want them to advance even past what we are. Isn't that what a good parent does? Right? <coughs> I've got something. I've got something for you. This is beyond your wildest dreams. You've got a heritage from the church in John Paul II. We're not going to let his death be in vain. We're, I'm, I'm going to give you this. But you need to become the expert. And you say, you're a leader. Your, your friends need you. Your peers need you. When you go to college, this is what's going to happen. Talk to them about that. We need to treat the teens as leaders. I'll tell you what, I look at my kids, and, and even when we travel around, uh, I see this in their eyes, but, but I, I'm working with the same boys for years. These, these kids know that they are in a battle. They, they realize they've been born into a world that's really messed up. 
and they're longing to do something about it. That's why they're going off to Iraq and Afghanistan to fight in a war that they might not return from. They, they want to change the world. John Paul II says y y the zeal and idealism of youth is something we have to capitalize on. So, but they need to hear adults say, I believe in you. You, ca you can learn this and do it. So we treat them as leaders, and that means we have to talk to them. We've got we to talk to them about the issues. All right, H. I'm pushing it a little bit more here. You ready? I'm just going to say, handle hot button issues. If Mel Gibson took his kids and only had them fire in a simulation, there's no way when they got into the battle situation they would have been able to survive. I don't know what he did, but whatever he did, it was real. So they had shot at moving targets before. They had faced some kind of fear before. And we have to do the same thing with our team. We, we have to be able to get into the real issues with them. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of things I've developed over the last few years, and much of this with the help of my own study and, and Father Tom, that I always have in my, my arsenal. We, we want to have some things that we always ha we're always equipped with. So if we find ourselves in a, in a warlike situation with teens, we catch him watching a movie, we say, oh, geez. And I, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he's watching that movie. I thought, I thought I raised him better than that. Catch him listening to music, he shouldn't be listening to. Whatever it is, we have something we can respond with. So here are just a few things that I kind of always keep ready to pull out, like a pistol. All right, one is, you probably got the idea from the essays that I break down premarital sex into five things. Five reasons you shouldn't have premarital sex. You can make it three, you can make it seven. They don't care, they're not gonna check up. T teens just trust you, so you can say whatever you want. If it's packaged properly, they're gonna buy it. Okay? So with premarital sex, we say you're lying with the language of your body. Um, two, you're always using someone, you're always treating the other person as an object. <clears throat> three, it's an oxymoron, thank you. And then with boys it's great, because you can say, no, I didn't say moron, but if the shoe fits, wear it. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, yeah. You're a moron for living this way. <laughs> and they like it when you can empower them. So it's an oxymoron. Sex, one flesh union, is wedding vows. Have wedding vows outside of marriage makes absolutely no sense. It, and See, now there's the principle, and then you've got to spend some time flushing that out for them. But they get it. Okay, so it's an oxymoron. You're supposed to be imaging the Trinity in your love, which requires a total gift of self. They get it that you're not giving a total gift of yourself if you're not committed and you're using contraception. That's not a total gift. So they get it. Four is, from Mary Beth Bonacci, adultery in advance. They love that one. And the fifth one is, it's re-gifting. Mm -hmm. And they all know what that is. And you can use the Socratic method with them. What's a, hey, what, you know, what's regifting and you're talking about it and they know what it is. Okay, so they, they get it. I, we were doing that one time a few years ago about the regifting yourself. And one of the boys said, yeah, yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you put it? My bride deserves a groom that's brand new. <laughs> I said, that's right. Okay. So they, they will start to work this themselves and they're going to come up with stuff that is hysterical. <laughs> and, and you'll love it. All right, I also do the four archetypes of man, the four original archetypes of man. We talk about Adam and Eve, what it happened when they looked at each other. Man w is made to be a king, a warrior, a lover, and we talk about what real love is. So we take the secular ethos that talks about lovers, players, and we twist it. We turn it upside down, and we say this is what it means to be a lover. You're, you look at that woman as a person, you give your life for that woman. That's what it means to be a lover. And they get it. And fourthly is priest father. And we talk about how every man is meant to be a priest. Now we could, have, we could have some sessions just on that and go into those four archetypes, but we don't have time today. But you got those. Okay? Then we talk about, we'll set it up, I'll say, what did Adam say when he saw Eve? The first words that came out of a man's mouth in history were, Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Right? He starts to write poetry. He's looking around the garden for flowers. <laughs> he can't believe this. And we, and we say, you know, 
The Bible only gives us the first part of that poem. The second part of that poem, it, Adam goes into the 12 original mysteries of woman. And he tells her who she is. She's God's masterpiece. She is model of the human race. She is a garden enclosed. She is a fountain sealed. She is a genius in her receptivity. She is master of her own mystery. She is a creator of culture. That's from Katrina Zeno. She brings beauty everywhere she goes. She is the first evangelist. That's from John Paul II's letter. She has first contact with every human person. Amazing. She's the first evangelist. She's an icon of the church. She's an icon of heaven. She is daughter, sister, mother, bride. And she is the sum total of all beauty. And just to put a cherry on top, John Paul II says, she, to sum it up, she's the one who is loved. And we go through, and then we break all those down. We spend a few days on this. The 12 original mysteries of women. And of course, women are more complex. They have 12. Men are simple. You have four. You know, <laughs> we do... We do three weeks on women, we do one day on guys, and we're done. <laughs> we'll move on. And they get it. And then another thing I'll do with the, 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 the men especially is when we, we talk about what has become the biggest threat to masculinity in our culture, which is pornography. <clears throat> Contraception affects both of us, but when I, fr when I present it, I usually say, for women, the biggest threat to your femininity and your life is contraception for men, it's pornography, and they go together. Where you have a cu contraceptive culture mentality, you have a pornographic culture and mentality. And then we break down pornography and I tell them, porn destroys, D, it acts like a drug, it releases hormones like morphine or codeine in your brain. You get addicted to it right away. E, it escalates. You start out with one little hit and it gets, you need more and more and more and more and it almost always leads to indulging yourself in some kind of mortal sin. S, it's very seductive. Don't think you can see it once in, and resist it. It's extremely seductive. We talk about that. T, it pr gives you a template for how to see women and all of reality. When you talk about the secular ethos, pornography is the, it's like the target like the enemy, that's what the devil uses to just get guys, boom, that's secular ethos right between the eyes. It creates a template. Men end up seeing every woman they, every woman they look at as an object. R, it replaces reality. Boys and men start to live out of a fantasy of a woman instead of knowing how to relate to a real woman. O, it objectifies the woman. You don't care what she looks like in her face. You don't care what her name is. You don't care anything about her. You're just interested in gratifying yourself. Why? It affects youth primarily. Even maniacal assassins have said a lot of their problems stemmed when they were four years old and they saw pornography. The younger it strikes, the harder it is to overcome. And S, it is stealth. It is secret. It sneaks up on you. It hits you before you even know it. And then you have in your mind, like on a computer, pop-ups. Just like the pornographic pop-ups on a computer, they're in a man's heart, boom. He doesn't know what's going to trigger him. So that's pornography. And we talk about how you resist it and overcome it. So that's just an, an idea and tools you can use with your young people. You can use this with your, with your children. You say, son, I know you're list you like that rap music. And, you know, that's okay. But do you hear how they're talking about women? Yeah, mom. You know, but I'm just listening to the music, the melody. I don't. I'm not really listening to the words. Well, let me tell you something. Did you know there are twelve mysteries to a woman that he's not talking about in that song? Wow, mom, I didn't know that. You're so smart. Okay. <laughs> I'm like foolish Freddy. <laughs> okay. So we're the experts. Treat them as leaders. Handle the tough issues. And H also stands for hear them out. Hear them out. <clears throat> young people have a lot to say. One of the biggest complaints I've heard on retreats that we've done with young people is that they'll often say, we don't have a chance to say what's on our mind. Now, this does not mean you have to act like a teenager, which is one of the mistakes I think is often, adults often make. But it does mean, in a certain sense, we have to get on their level and, and let them know we, we've seen their world 
and we're interested in the struggles that they're having, and we hear them out. What do you, what do you think are the top three questions that teens ask about sex. If you were to be in a, ask your son or daughter, or if you be in a room of high schoolers, and you say, all right, write out questions. What are your questions about sex? What do you think are the top three? How far is too far? Great, excellent. How far is too far? That's no, almost always number one. What's the second one? What if, is it too late if I've already found mistake? That's good. Now, I don't hear that a lot in my circles, <laughs> <coughs> fortunately, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, but, but I think that's a big one. It has to do with the first question. How far is too far? And then you usually, you, you talk to them about the nature of that question, and then you give them some principles, and then they always think that wasn't, oh, that didn't answer my question. All right, I'll be specific. And they ask about, they, they always ask about oral sex. That's, that is... Maybe, maybe some adults don't know this right now, but that's rampant. It's totally rampant right now. Um, oral sex, and, and this, this may be as arresting to some people as that scene was and sobering, but uh, if you haven't heard of this, kids are now doing something which uh, w they've been doing it for a while, called something called Friends with Benefits, where basically two teenage friends just get together and say, well, let's experience sexual intercourse so we can know what the big deal is. No strings attached, we'll still remain friends. There's nothing romantic, there's nothing, there's not even a pretense of love, they're just doing it as an experience. Okay, so this, this stuff's going on and the good kids, when they see that, they want to know, well, okay, I'm not doing that, so what's wrong with oral sex? Because it seems like everybody's doing that. And I think the third question is homosexuality. That always comes up. So I want to take a couple minutes just to address each of those briefly. And perhaps you've thought of some of these ideas on your own. But I want to address it. How far is too far? <coughs> I have a handout for you. Sister. How far is too far? If you listen to any of the great presenters on this topic in our culture, the Jason and Kristalina Everts, the, the Christopher West, the Mary Beth Bonacci's, the Molly Kelly, uh, when she was doing her chastity talks, or anyone else, and I remember hearing this years and years and years and years ago when, when I was just starting out in youth ministry, most good speakers will say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. First of all, you're asking the wrong question. How far is too far? Because you're basically asking, well, how close can I get to the line of sinning before it's a sin? <coughs> Teens are very black and white. That's why they need the structure. But once they get to be sophomores, juniors, seniors, we want to start pulling them out of the black and white and getting them to think more ethos. So this is something that we've been doing in our classroom. John Paul II... has a fresh approach to the idea of virginity. He talks about virginity in its negative aspect and its positive aspect. And he says that it's true that virginity has the negative aspect. When he says negative aspect, what do you think? When you hear virginity, he's a virgin or practicing virginity, what does it normally mean? You haven't had sex. It means abstinence from sex. It means bodily uh, non-involvement with sexual intercourse. That's, and John Paul II says, yes, that's one of the definitions of virginity. But he says the concept of virginity goes much deeper than that. And I find teens, teens love this. They're really grabbing onto it. He says, virginity really means <clears throat> having sexual integrity. Being sexually intact. The, the word virgin in other contexts means what? We talk about vir pure. Yeah, well, like you talk about virgin what? Virgin woods, virgin olive woods, forest, virgin olive oil, right? Virgin woods, virgin snow. 
<laughs> okay, it hasn't been yeah, right, it hasn't been stepped on yet. It's pure. Okay. So John Paul II is as he often what he often does is he takes a concept that is true and then he sort of embellishes it. He completes it. He doesn't change it, he completes it. He does that with St. Thomas Aquinas and he does this with this concept. He says, Yeah, not having sexual intercourse in a sense is virginity, but but virginity uh, when we talk about the total person means my head, my heart, and my groins are all in a line with God's plan. And they're all working together. It's integrated. That's what it means to be a virgin. Now, kids go, huh, you've got to be careful with teens. And they say, oh, all right, well, then I can do whatever I want. I'm still a virgin, right? Because oh, I got it all, everything's intact, Mr. Reedy. Okay. No, that's not what we mean. So you've got to be a little bit careful. But, but with, especially with kids who have had a little formation already, they get this. And I, I'll say... What does it mean to have sexual integrity? Well, it means you have the capacity to give a total gift of yourself. That's what sexual integrity means. You have lived your life in such a way your heart and your desires and your mind and your body are working together so that it's possible for you to give yourself totally to another as a gift. <clears throat> capacity for total self-gift. And if you like, you can link that up with the four promises that we make at the altar when we get married. And who, who knows what the four things are that we promise with our spouse at the, at the altar? Good. Excellent. Total, fruitful, faithful, free. You are called as a human being to give yourself in a way that's total, fruitful, faithful, free to another. And you can get into all this stuff. That's virginity. That's sexual integrity. So then, then what I like to say to teens is, all right, you develop this by the way you see. How do you see women? How do you see men? What's your ethos? Are you, are you understanding? Do you have the TOB glasses on as you're developing that? And... What I'll say is, now, if you look at it this way, first of all, you can, can you, do you have to have sexual penetration to lose this? Can this be compromised outside of sexual intercourse? Could you diminish or jeopardize your capacity to give yourself totally faithfully and freely? You, you sure can. You can lose virginity in this sense well before sexual intercourse. Now, the, why I like that is, because the oral sex question and the how far I can go question gets answered with this. It's not about how far you can go as if sex is just a precipice and once you jump off that you're no longer a virgin, you've sinned and you've done something wrong but up to that point you're free to move about. No, this is a, this is a symphony that you're living out in your sexuality and it has different parts but it, it's all one, com one symphony and you can start to ruin that symphony if you start to take out parts and, and misuse them. So you can do a lot of things that diminish this. Pornography jeopardizes your virginity. Oral sex jeopardizes your virginity. Heavy petting may jeopardize your virginity. You, just, you, can, you can talk about specific questions that they have. Why is grinding wrong? I always get that one. Can't we grind at the... At the, if you don't know what grinding is, it's the dancing that teens do these days. They get in a big circle and they rub all their body parts all over each other. Excuse me for my frankness. Okay, so it's, the, it, it's dancing that in a way that mimics sexual intercourse. And kids, that's, that's how they dance. Well, what's wrong with grinding? Okay, let's go back to this. What does that do to your ability to give yourself to a spouse totally, faithfully, fruitfully, and freely? And you can discuss why that could be that could hurt them. Okay? Now the other thing it does is it says, if you make a mistake, and I've had a lot of conversations with Katrina Zeno about this, because the, the old term used to be secondhand virginity or second virginity, right? You can get your virginity back. This, this gives a little bit of take on it. Instead of saying you get your virginity back, what you say is you've, in this sense, you've compromised this capacity to give a total gift. With Jesus Christ, nothing is impossible. You, you can recapacitate yourself and give a gift, a total gift of yourself again. It is possible. 
and it takes a little bit of that edge off that, well, okay, I fell off the cliff, I'll never be a sa the same. And it allows kids to know, all right. So they're not just choked up by, they, you know, the old ethos is, gosh, geez, Louise, I better not make a mistake, <laughs> or I'm, I'm done for. And, and a kid with a, a, a strong conscience or a sensitive conscience can really start to become scrupulous there. So this is a little more, for, hey, settle down. What, when you're with the opposite sex, how are you building up this gift? She or he is are not your spouse yet. How are you building up this gift? Gift of self. That's what you're working on. Now, also, I often ask teens, and this is a great one, say, have you ever heard somebody say, yeah, I waited until I got married and to have sex. You know, my, my wife and I, or my husband, we, we waited until we got married. Um, and then on our, we decided we didn't want to lose our virginity till our wedding night. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I lost my virginity on my wedding night? I've never heard anybody say that. You have? One couple. One couple. They said they had so much pressure, though, from their family huh. and friends, and they said it was, that they were Catholic. Hmm. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of pressure? Tons of pressure. Really pressure to, they had sex. pressure to have sex before, before they got married. Okay. So they're probably already looking at it from a, a skewed ethos. Right? If we're teaching kids that they're made for marriage and that that means to give a total gift of themselves. And we keep repeating that over and over and over. Repetition is the mother of learning. Repetition is the mother of learning. Repetition is the mother of learning. Repetition is the mother of what? Of learning. That's right. What's the mother of learning? <laughs> Repetition. Very good. Because they, they, it's going in one ear and out the other. Going in one ear and out the other. Then they, they're bombarded with the other ethos, the other message all day. If we keep repeating these concepts, gift, they get it. And I've never heard... In, this is the first time I've ever heard anybody who, who referred to their wedding night consummation as losing their virginity. Why don't people talk about it like that? Because they're not losing their virginity. In this sense, married couples don't, who wait don't lose their virginity. They actually they share their virginity. They share their, their capacity to give a gift of themselves. They, they fulfill their virginity. They complete their virginity. This gift should be growing for the rest of your life. Your capacity to give more and more and more and more authentically. So give them the structure and then give them more and let them aim for it. Yes? I have a question about like, the Bill Clinton situation. The Bill Clinton situation. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Yes. W the, the question is, what, what about something like the, the case of Bill Clinton, where the nation decided that if you're not copulating, you're not having sex. It's something else, even though we still call it oral sex, or, right? And that's a good question. I, I think it comes back to the fact that the secular culture, and it, it affects our, us two Catholics, we compartmentalize everything. So when it's for our convenience, we compartmentalize. So we say intercourse, sex. Anything outside of intercourse, it's not really sex, so what's wrong with it? Instead of realizing, and this, I was going to make this point, that life is lived on the bell curve. And this is another thing we show the students. The bell curve. It's a nice image. They know what it is. This is the rhythm of life. And we know that because it's stamped right in our sexuality. With older kids, I will, I will say, this is, this is what happens in sexual union. But it also happens in a good novel. It happens in a good movie. Any art form has this. It happens in agriculture and nature. Plants grow. They die. There's a fallow period. They start to blossom again. They die. There's a fallow period. Rain comes down, waters, goes back up. All of life is lived on that curve. It's a, very, it's a Tabor concept that is very key. Because when you're talking about all this, you can say, all right, men and women, the bell curve. Just like in a novel, there's a, there's a starting period, a building up period, a rising. Then there's a, in, in a novel we call this the climax. Then there's the denouement, the downward action. 
and and sexual union s sexual sexual union doesn't start here and end here it starts here and ends there and this is all one symphony to take out any one part of this and say I want to use this over here for for something else is is to disintegrate your sexuality it disrupts the the act which is one it's really a prayer it's one prayer it would be like walking into the church opening up the tabernacle and just eat, taking the Eucharist genuflecting and leaving that's all I, that's all I wanted I didn't want to have to sit through that guy's homily again <laughs> Jeez Louise <laughs> I'll wait till he leaves and then <clears throat> so but we compartmentalize everything we do that with mass too hey father what's the exact time I have to be at mass <laughs> so that I can receive the Eucharist <laughs> don't we ask that question <laughs> all right so we we love to compartmentalize that's our that's our secular ethos we can't help it so it's helpful to recognize these things so we can counteract it so the bell curve <coughs> all right let me say one thing about homosexuality. Are there any questions up to this point? Because I've given you a lot. Questions? So will you, will you ever say to kids that oral sex is sex, or you don't quite answer that question and just put it in the whole context? The question is, do I ever say, do I ever say to kids that oral sex is sex, or do I put it in the whole context? I usually, I usually answer it in the context. I take it out and I say, all right, let's, let's go over this again. Repetition is the mother of learning. Why did we draw that bell curve three weeks ago or last year? What does that mean? Okay, so you tell me. I do that a lot of that. You tell me. What, what do you think about oral sex? Why do you think, where does it f sit here, and why do you think the church would say, uh-uh, you shouldn't do it? <clears throat> and they get it. They get it. They don't like it all the time, <laughs> but they, they get it. And they're, they're struggling with the issues as we all are. All right, homosexuality. Father Time is the master on this topic. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it comes up constantly. So here's what I'd say. You get a question about homosexuality, or you're watching TV, and there's a scene in TV, or you read the news story about Denver. Did you guys hear about Denver? Okay. Washington, D.C., the two, two uh, Georgetown students. Georgetown students. Married in Washington, D.C., this week. Pronounced husband and husband. Husband and husband Georgetown. in D.C. There were two Georgetown students, two men, Georgetown who were married by a judge. By a judge. She pronounced them husband and husband. Husband and husband. So here we go again. Okay. Boy, I really don't want war. Jeez, I, don't, I wish we didn't have to talk about this stuff, but I'll tell you what. If we don't equip our kids with some armaments, theological armaments, they have no, they have no clue how to address these topics. What are they going to do? In the future, they're our hope. We got to we got to stem this tide. Last night, my sister and I got into discussion on the phone, and she said, listening to Relevant Radio, she heard that they had taken uh, children away from the two lesbians, and she was irate that two women who love yes. these children love these children, and then you get married couples who are fighting in divorce court, and their children are. Mm -hmm. And how can our church, you know, it's time for lesbian marriage? Yes. That's Yes. Uh, it's a, a logic that is a horrific logic, but how do you answer that? We're saying, for those of you in cyberspace, we are saying that, uh, that, that even, even Catholics or even uh, some Catholics are surprised at the fact that we would not allow lesbian couples to adopt, for example. And this is our ethos. We're ha going to have to have an answer. Now, this is a tough one. It's a very tough one. So it deserves more time. With teens, here's what I would suggest somebody asks a question or a situation arises about homosexuality take off your shoes take off your shoes huh take off your shoes and ask the teen could I can I put my left foot in my right shoe this is, this all comes down to God's order of things that's, that, that's the ethos you're getting at sometimes they'll say no and that's why I say take off your shoes I say yes I can and I put it in there and I tie it <clears throat> Yes, I can. All right, and then I say, now, 
the fact that I can do this with my body, does that change the meaning of who I am? Does, is that really a right foot now instead of a left foot because it's in the right shoe? No. Why not? Because it's not because that's not what it is. That's right. That's not what it. The body speaks a language. My left foot is not meant to go in my right shoe, even if it can. Now, what if I walked around in that for a while? How would it feel? It would hurt. It would hurt. Okay. Do you think I could get used to it if I walked around on it long enough? Yeah. What if everybody started putting their shoes on the other foot and started walking around like that, just like everybody wears their pants down here now, right? And <laughs> You know, sunshine in your eyes, but you turn the baseball hat this way, and you're going, hey, I'm cool, man, but you can't see. All right. All right. What if everybody started doing that? Would it start to look normal? Would you not even notice it anymore? You wouldn't even notice it. You might even say, it's a law. You have to wear your baseball hat like this from now on. And what are you doing with your shoes on the wrong feet? Okay, switch those. All right. They get the point. The point is, the body has a language, and a male body and a male body do n are not made to fit together and everybody knows it and I always tell teens we have to treat this with 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 a lot of sensitivity not with um, bravado and a sense of superiority and, and authority we have to be firm and honest but we also have to be very sensitive and say I, I don't know what causes a homosexual attraction we could talk about all the science all I know is it's very clear how the body is designed. I don't have to talk about God. A male body, male body, female body, female body. They're not made to go together. It's actually unhealthy. So why are we trying to force this? Well then, but what if they love each other? We're consistent. We are consistent. What our body tells us about our physical nature is true for our mind, our heart, our soul, our spirit, our emotions. So if they're attracted, I don't know, something else is going on there. But the answer is not try to force one foot into the other shoe. That's, ne that's not going to work. It's a, it's a natural law argument. But at least it, for teens, I, I've a, I ha actually have had teens who are in favor of homosexual marriage who uh, once or twice it's happened where they've said, oh, I get it. I get it. And they've They've seen, the, they've seen it. And it's sensitive. Now, if I were talking to someone with a same-sex attraction, I, I would be very sensitive and ask a lot of questions and try to develop a relationship. But I, I, would, I would encourage the person that whatever's going on emotionally, there, there's, there's, something, there's something that's just a little bit off about that. Okay. It's also the group Courage. Courage, yeah. yes. It's Courage R C. Courage RC.net. For, for Catholics with same sex attraction. Yes. Do you want yes. Dash or just, no, courage RC. Courage Roman RC, Roman Catholic. Dot Roman Catholic net. Dot net. For people, it's a whole wonderful, wonderful organization for Catholics who have same sex attraction and they're struggling with that. Yes. And there's a teen part of that website as well. Teens. I want to just spend one more minute on this because it's, it's so, so important. Yes? <coughs> Question? Oh, the question is about masturbation. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> okay. If you've given if you've given them this, if you talked about premarital sex, it, the beauty of the theology of body is when you give them the basic principles, people get it. And then it answers all the questions by itself. It answers the question about male and female priesthood. It's 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 evident. Masturbation I let the kids tell me, all right, now you tell me what's wrong with masturbation. And one time about three years ago I had a kid say it's half flesh union. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that, that sums it up. That sums it up. Th they get it that the, 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 we, we talk a lot more in detail about this bell curve and that the union between man and woman, including the pleasure, is meant, and I read from John Paul II where he says, that's meant to be shared. And the reason is that you're experiencing the love of the Trinity and, and actually imaging it at the same time. You are imaging Christ's love for the church. And so, so to, to compartmentalize that, break it up, it, you lose you lose that. You're no longer imaging what you're supposed to image. I was going to say one more thing about homosexuality. <clears throat> They're really struggling with this. The, the kids who intuit that it's, that it's a little bit off. 
they don't know, they're very frightened about going into a school that might require people to wear a, a shirt on a day that says, you know, pro-gay. And there's a real push, a real push in the culture for the, the what they call the LG, is it LGTB, right? Yeah, it's LGTB, lesbian, uh, gay, transsexual, bisexual. Questioning. Q and Q questioning. Oh, and question, is it a Q now? Questioning. questioning. Deferring. <coughs> Why do I have to choose that? Mm. Mm. You're forcing me to choose. Mm. So this is serious. And this is, this is serious. <coughs> this is in, in the public schools. This is a movement that's going on right now. This that's is gaining speed. Comments we have here. Um, also, at my school, they're trying to normalize being transgender, making changes to the bathrooms <coughs> and stuff, so they <coughs> are not segregated by gender. <coughs> yeah. So there's no separation. Yeah. All right, now steady, steady. <laughs> Remember what we talked about, okay? <laughs> steady. This is this is why this is perfect. Is I have the same reaction. Oh my gosh! <laughs> right? Like we've crossed the point of no return. The, the the people who are pushing this doctrine are are not going to stop at anything. And so, with love and confidence. We have to show them another, the, the human Catholic ethos. Steady. We've got to show our kids it's okay. You can do it. And they might ask you questions about this 10, 15, 20 times. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me again that thing you said a year ago? Because I, I'm revisiting this and I don't remember what do I say to somebody. So you've got to keep going over it. All right. Now I'm going to go back to the chart because we only have about 15 minutes. And I want to sh I've got to show you one more movie clip. Orient them to Christ and the church. If we're going to help these kids and give them a new ethos, we have to make sure they see the relevance of the church. Who has the answers in a mixed up, messed up time? Jesus Christ has the answers. If John Paul II is the coach, Jesus Christ is the man. <laughs> I, always, I tell the kids, hey, when you hear someone say, hey, he's the man, or you're the man, I say, I'm not the man, he's the man. He's the man, the God man. He's the God man. He came down to reintegrate what we've split, sexuality and spirituality. Point them to the church. And that's where you can get into things like Christ on the cross and all the stuff you've probably been learning in your studies. Christ on the cross, pouring out his blood and his body for his bride, and that the the Eucharist is really nuptial or spousal, and the marital bed is really liturgical and Eucharistic. And I'm telling you, it blows the kids' minds. They can't believe, what, what are you saying? Mm -hmm. And so you, you got them. And you say, this, this is what it means to be human. You want to live your sexuality. You want to have great sex. Like, you know, 100 ways to have great sex that you're mm -hmm. seeing every day in the Walgreens checkout aisle. This is it. We've, we, we've got the answer. I think some of the, the concepts in this category that ring the, the, the most true with the youth are this. Language of the body. The opposite of love is not hatred, it's use. The language of gift, giving a total and sincere gift of self. That's a big one. And tabernacle. Wow. I mean, this you're talking, you want to change a kid's ethos? Explain to him or her that a woman's body is a living tabernacle. There is not a priest on earth who is deserving of consecrating that Eucharist. John Paul II was not worthy of raising that host. St. Peter was not. There, there's not a human being who's worthy of taking Jesus Christ's body in his own hands. And I would say there's not a man on earth who is worthy to approach a woman and her living tabernacle. And when men can, and women can learn that that's the ethos, when women know that that's their dignity and don't, don't even think about a man who sees them other than a priest seeing that Eucharist, and men see women, young men see young women, 
and treat them with the reverence they treat the tabernacle. You know, we go into a church and we go like this, and it's not an accident that that's how a man proposes to a woman, like this. That's, that's seeing with the theology of the body ethos. So you can give them little assignments. Okay, girls, this week I want you to dress like you're a tabernacle. <laughs> Guys, this week, every time you see a girl, I want you to say, tabernacle, tabernacle. Sometimes you may go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, uh, tabernacle, 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 tabernacle. Okay. <clears throat> give them a little assignment. We've we got to practice this. We're not used to seeing this way. So it's one thing for them to hear, oh, yeah, that's great. Wow, I was really inspired when I heard that, that lady say that. But it's another thing to, to digest it and inculcate it. Give them an assignment. All right, number five. We're the experts. Treat them like leaders. Talk to them like leaders. Handle the hot-button issues. Hear them out. Listen to their questions. Orient them to Christ. S is T-O-B, showtime, it's showtime. Showtime, all right. Once we start giving the kids this stuff, we need to find ways to have them be creative with it and regurgitate it and, and work the material, so to speak, you know, get them in there. And we also need to show that um, this ethos is everywhere. It's in our culture. Go to their culture. So Christopher West is a genius at making connections between rock music right, and, and theology of the body. And it, it, you can do that. In our classes, we do that. I take a couple songs from my era, a couple classic rock songs, and I play it. And, oh, yeah, that's cool. If they haven't heard it, it's cool. If they have heard it, they're like, yeah, yeah, I know this. And then we go through the lyrics. And you'd be, you'd be amazed. Some of the lyrics of these songs, you could point back to this stuff. You can break it down. I do this in class. And I say, OK, what's the person really hungering for? What do they say they want? All right, unpack that. And like, oh my gosh, they want this. That's right. And then, you, and then what we do is I have the kids pick a song, and then they have to give a five minute presentation on it. They love it. They get to play the song. They get to play the song. They get to talk about it. Now, here's where you got to do a lot. Your your training. They're not always going to hit the target. Got to remember that. So don't go. Oh my gosh! You think that's he's talking about love there? Ah! <laughs> you just say, yeah. I don't think he's talking about giving a gift of himself. That's what he wants. But I don't think that's what he's saying. Oh really? Okay. And then you. you but we train them to have a theology body ear. Movies. Mm -hmm. I love this one, okay. movies. We s watch several movies in class, and I have, a, I have a handout for you guys at the end that has a list of what I think are some of the best theology to body <coughs> movies to pull out themes of masculinity and femininity especially. Um, but you can watch a movie and then have them write a little essay on it, or parents at home watch a movie and then talk about it. Hey, let's have a discussion. Or if you, have, if you know some young adults older than your kids, one of the best things you can do, you gotta start having that person over for dinner more often. So the kids can be exposed to young people who are out in the world who are really trying to live this. They, they need mentors because they don't always listen to their parents. And you, can have, you can say to that kid, hey, why don't you do this one time? Watch a movie and then talk about it. My, my kids, some of the insights they come up with, it's incredible. I, I, I learned so much from them. It's amazing. Um, all right, so, oh, shoot, we got to land at 12, right? Well. I mean, people can leave if they have to, but anyone want to stay? You can stay. If you can stay, I can stay. I, I'll, I'm going to save the movie clip for about five minutes because I want to say one. I want to say one other thing, which is we have a story to tell. It's the Christ story, and it's everywhere, and it's in every movie. It's in every art form. Whenever somebody's expressing the the deepest recesses of humanity, they're expressing the Christ story, whether they know Him or not. And that's why every movie that we like is usually the same. You know how the movie, they're almost all the same. Right? Here, and here they are. Almost every movie that we like that wins an Oscar. Guy meets girl, neither one of them is, they're both available. They don't usually have family. But what she doesn't know is the guy is working against some great conspiracy 
right? And so he's got a lot of work to do. Then all of a sudden, the, the conspirator finds out that they're falling in love, and he grabs the girl. So now the guy's doubly mad at the conspirator. And he takes her to the other side of the country or overseas, and then this guy spends about 45 minutes to an hour and a half going through over mountains, and he's getting shot at, and things are exploding just to get to that girl. And he finally gets to the girl, and he crashes through the ceiling, and he j lands on the guy, and then they have a fight. And first it looks like the good guy's losing, and then he's winning. And then it looks like he's losing, and then he's winning. Then it looks like he's dead. But he's not really dead. He comes back. He hits a guy. He usually throws him out a window. He tumbles down. Many stories are off a cliff where it's very dramatic. There's an explosion. So you know he's dead. He looks into the woman's eyes. They smile. The credits roll. And they live happily ever after. <laughs> and then somebody says, I, I'm going to write a movie like that, but I'm just going to change the names. And instead of a South American conspiracy, I'm going to make it a European conspiracy. And we go and we, oh my gosh, this movie's incredible. I love it. <laughs> Isn't this the truth? No, we're, just, we're just total suckers. We're saps. We're locked in. We can't help it. That's our story. That's, the, that's, what ha that's what's going on right now. Jesus Christ is a hero who has busted into humanity through the ceiling <coughs> of human nature. He's penetrated with his divine nature. He's crashed through and he's stomped on the enemy. And Stomping on the enemy, he's grabbed humanity by the hand, his bride. And then just, you know, you jump to the bottom of a pool, you know, and you have that pause. That's like Christ when he dies and he harrows hell, he goes down to hell. He, he goes down and he's got that pause. Well, he's stomping on Satan's head, he's grabbing Adam and Eve and the rest of humanity, and, <laughs> and we resurrect with him. That's what happens at every Eucharist. We're watching that movie, and we're the actors. We're the, real, we're the real players. I've never met a bride who is sick of telling the story of how her husband proposed. We need to tell the story of how our bridegroom has proposed. Because it's better than any other story around. So we, we tell kids that and they get it. They realize, wow, this faith is, that I have, is, this, thing, this is worth living for. This may be worth dying for. Right, I want to end, before we show the movie clip, if you can stay, I want to read you just a couple more brief things because we're doing before and after. Right? So before, you, we've got an idea of what teens think about sex and the faith and how much they can say about it or how little. And this is after. We did, <laughs> now this is where it gets fun. We did a little experiment. We just did it this week. In my class, my students are calling my JP2 class for the seniors. And, and this is stuff I'm doing with older guys who've had, had a lot of formation in this already. They call the one kid the TOB matchmaker. <laughs> and they like to tease him. He loves it. He, he eats it up. He's a TOB matchmaker, they tell him. You know so much about this. You're the so what we decided to do was write TOB personal ads. <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> well, okay, so I'm going to read a few of them. They're short. So you, you see how you can form the ethos. They should go into this media, media um, Catholics Come Home campaign and get those ads mm -hmm. up on uh, <laughs> Catholics Come Home. I don't know his last name, Tom. He's producer. Tom, who's producer? I think he's producer. Oh, yeah. the, uh, the ads for It's a, it's fun. It's creative and, and it, yeah, it does, and it shows how much they know, really deep down. All right, ready? Catholic man looking for real woman. <laughs> Must be pro-life, preferably Catholic, virgin. Looking for a serious relationship. Respects herself. Recognizes she has a tabernacle. <laughs> Has. <laughs> We're getting there. A uh, real Catholic man knows how to treat women. <laughs> I am a TOB man looking for a TOB woman. <laughs> I am looking for a woman who will give a sincere gift of herself to me as I will give to her. She shall be the sum total of all beauty. I want marriage and many children. I want her to be beautiful, smart, and to be a good cook. <laughs> One step at a time. <laughs> Listen to this one. And he, he's using this in the, the proper sense. <laughs> Catholic virginal man 
looking for a T.O.B. loving woman. <laughs> looking to meet God's masterpiece. He's guided bullet points. Respectful of woman's dignity, the one to be loved. Handsome and pro-feminine genius. <laughs> <laughs> desiring, <laughs> desiring to love for all the right reasons. And then he puts, call 1-800-TOB-MATCHMAKER. <laughs> just to get the other guy. This one is a little less like an ad and, and uh, well, it's just a little more profound. You'll see. Hello, I am a handsome, young, t it's good that they have confidence, isn't it? Yeah. I, hello, I'm a handsome, young, T.O.B. man looking for a T.O.B. woman. <laughs> I understand the beauty of human dignity with its root in our creation by God in his image and likeness, the only creatures willed for our own sake. I understand and treasure the difference and complementarity of man and woman. As a true man, in light of God's revelation, I seek always to protect those around me. I am ambitious in my undertakings and far-sighted in my vision. I am also proud of my role as the Im initiator of love. You don't call me, I call you. <laughs> and, as, <laughs> and as long as you dine with me, leave your money home because I pay the bill. <laughs> This man, <laughs> this, uh, it's hard to get through this without laughing. This manliness that defines me is also tempered and embellished by my understanding of true femininity. I understand woman as God's masterpiece, made to be loved, never to be used, and as a garden in clothes. Although I desire one flesh union with my future wife, a complete and sincere, unconditional, mutual gift of self, I realize that ultimately woman is the master of her own mystery. <laughs> And she alone holds the key that will let me in if she decides. I really do appreciate women and strive to be a true man myself. Wow. Good job. Good work. Well, how about a hand for all of our youth all over the country who are learning this? So that gives you a little idea of what our kids are capable of. And I, don't, I, I think it's beautiful. I think it's a reason for great encouragement. Uh, and we should go forth. Yes. Well, I've been te I've been teaching this in high school. This is my fifth year. So no one yet. <laughs> Not yet. Now the first group I taught this to, it wasn't full time. I was just I just came in for a little two week session with them. I didn't have them for religion. They're graduating. The they're graduating this year, or maybe next year. I keep track. Okay. First, it took me a couple years to to be able to do this kind of full time, but it, it's a great opportunity. And if there are any other teachers out there, I would r encourage you to approach your de head, your department heads, and see if you can get a, if you're not already doing it, get a theology of the body elective going. And what book would you recommend? The books I would recommend, and I'll pass out a sheet for all of you right now is not necessarily in this order, but the first one is definitely top. The best book I've found to use with teens is, without a doubt, David Hayduke, Pauline Press, Sisters of St. Paul, God's Plan for You. It's, it lays out the, 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 the theology very nicely. It's simple. He knows how to relate to teenagers. He's been a teacher himself for years. He uses their language, he relates them, but he's not a kid. So, and every kid who's read it said, we really like that, it's best, the best thing, this guy really understands us. So I'd say that's number one. Second, I put Pure Love, Pure Womanhood, and Pure Manhood by Jason and Kristalina Everett. It's, it's phenomenal, and some of the statistics they have, and just their, their approach is, is just what we're looking for. Real Love by Mary Beth Minacci, that's a question and answer book. If you're a parent, and you're frightened about some of the questions your kids may have, I think real love answers them all. TOB for teens, that's the, that's the handbook. It's got a textbook, it's, it's soft cover, and a workbook. So it's a, it's a whole curriculum, a year-long curriculum. You could use it with a youth group in the summer or during a school year, weekly. You could use it in a classroom. I have a parent in our school whose son's a sophomore and she's taking her son through it at home. And it's, it's fantastic. TOB for Beginners by Christopher is, it's a little bit heavy for most teenagers, 
But if you're giving them the ethos, they, you, can, you can use excerpts and have them read certain chapters and, and they can follow it. Plus it's another way to keep, you know, to keep pushing them higher. When we changed the language in the liturgy to teenage language, and that's actually what we did after Vatican II, we changed, we changed the language to adolescent language. We really did a disservice to our whole church, including the young people, because we, we lose the sense of the transcendent. There, it's always good for a teacher to throw in words at least once a day that kids don't know. And if they want to know it, they can raise their hand. If not, they know they're still, they still have a lot to learn. And, that, and that's, that's fine, because that's, that's true. And then Body and Gift or pu- and Purity of Heart by Sam Tarode are really good reflections, maybe more suited to young adults than high schoolers. I also listed some movies. This is a um, really excellent book. Oh, Two books in yeah, one, right. Theology of Her Body you know, yeah, and His yeah. Body. Thank excellent. you. It's a great introduction. Thank you. Like That's wonderful. Like to put wonderful. in the hands of teens, not a textbook. <clears throat> That's great. Okay. Now, here are some movies. I admit, these are my favorites, and they're ones I've seen. So, uh, But there are a lot of TOB themes that you can pull out of these. And I've got ten of them. The Spider-Man series. Incredible. Especially to teach about the celibate life. He, he gets propositioned by the girl and he says, No, I've got, I've got something bigger to do. I've got it. Not that marriage isn't big, but he, he's called to something different. And he realizes in order to be free to do it, he, he, he couldn't, he'd be divided. A lot of superheroes are celibate. Right? Superheroes exactly. are celibate. Yeah. Superheroes are almost always celibate. And you can ask the kids why, and they'll, they'll come up with good answers. Uh, Batman Begins, another superhero. Phenomenal. Christian Bale, and he is, oh, he, he, he's, sh- it shows all of the aspects of masculinity. Fallen and redeemed. It's excellent. I Am Legend, wonderful. Gran Torino, it's rated R. You gotta see it, and I'll I'll leave it at that. Gran Torino is with Clint Eastwood, and it's one of his best movies yet, I think. Cinderella Man, ah, oh, for boys and girls, the the guys go yeah, and the girls go oh, <laughs> they they just love it. Gladiator and Braveheart, you you gotta have those two. They're both rated R, but they're classics. Truman Show. I've been showing Truman Show for about four, maybe five years in my moral theology class. It's really good. It's just I- interesting enough that kids are intrigued. And Truman Show stars Jim Carrey in a, in a serious role, but he's got a few good one-liners. Old movie. Maybe you heard of it. Magnificent Seven. Oh, Boys go crazy about that. Even though it's cowboy stuff, they love it. Magnificent Seven is it's a blockbuster with teen boys. There's, there's a scene in Magnificent Seven where there are some little, little kids come up to one of the, the seven, the heroes, and they say, they're in a Mexican village, and they say, we're ashamed of our father because you know, our father, all he does, he's a, he's a farmer. He's not like you, tough with a gut. And Charles Bronson is the here. I'm showing my age here. Charles Bronson takes one of the kids and spanks him. And sh- shakes him and says, don't you ever talk like that about your father. You think that I have courage because I have a gun? Your father has courage because he has the responsibility of you kids and it weighs him down every day like a rock. And I've never had that type of courage. And whoa, if you're a man, oh, it just, it gets you. And then the, finally, you got to see Rocky 1 and Rocky Balboa 6. They're bookends. They're the two best, I believe. And you notice something in Rocky and in Cinderella Man, because Ron Howard, the director of Cinderella, took a page out of the Rocky movies, there's no doubt, because there's a scene in Cinderella Man in the locker room that's very parallel to what Sylvester Stallone always does. Sylvester Stallone can never do it until he's got Adrian's support. It's classic. (laughs) The, The man wants to overcome some cause bigger than himself but he can't do it unless he's got his woman by his side and it's not until Adrian shows up that you know the girls all cry and the guys do too 